Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Uh, my name is John Barr, and I'm a history professor here at Lone Star College, Kingwood. And yeah, that's thank you for that cheer. All right, I don't often get that. I get boo. I get booze more often than that. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody in the room uh, for coming today, and I'd like to thank our online audience for coming today. So. I think this is the first time we've done this successfully, where we have an online audience and an and an out live audience at the same time. So, thank you all for uh, being experimentals, so to speak. You know, um, so this is part of our Curious Minds series, and uh, usually these take place on Friday at noon or twelve thirty, depending upon speaker availability. Uh, next week on Wednesday, we have a mathematician who's going to give an interesting talk on the 10 equations that rule the world. Now, he is in, uh, he lives overseas right now, from, I think Norway, so clearly uh, that's going to be online. <laughs> He's not going to be here. Uh, but that should be a very interesting talk. So, uh, Without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers today, uh, Joan Samuelson, but two of my colleagues from the English department and Sampata Dalvi, who are going to speak on, I'll share the screen here. Their topic for today is mad women and feminists learning about mental health and women's rights from two Victorian authors. Okay. How do I get back on? Oh, there I am. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Samuelson. And I guess you can see me in the little screen down at the bottom, right? Because yep. John said I need to be seen. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I realize that it's kind of wacky today. And in fact, I've had to cut my my talk a lot because we only have about 25 minutes each and the subject is so wonderful that we both ended up we ended up meeting several times and trying to figure out what was going to be the best thing to do and it's going to be very heavy crazy ladies and feminism and the focus may be a bit different than you might have been expecting and let me swing into this now i'm going to give you a little bit of background so the slides will go and johnny we won't have to worry at all about these slides because they'll go fairly quickly because of going to give you the usual background on writers and plots and characters, etc. And I'll skim through those. And then because of the time, I'm going straight to the topic uh, under that I'm working on, which is the journey motif in Jane Eyre and what happens with that character on the journey. And that Jane Eyre is not the only woman in her Charlotte Bronte's novel, but in fact, there's another one that is only since about the 19th century, 20th century being paid much attention to. And it's Sampada's theory, Dr. Dr. Dolly's theory, that this is a precursor, and, she'll, and I'm going to leave that to her for that particular line, but this is a precursor to the, the uh, 20th century and the 21st century and the, these um, uh, approaches toward the mad woman concept, and that they stream okay, from one to the next. So let me just uh, explain a little bit, those of you who may not know who Charlotte Bell is, I'm gonna do this very quickly. That is an original chalk drawing by a man named George Richmond at the time, 1850. So we're smack in the middle of the Victorian period here, meaning Queen Victoria, all right? And that also means that we're getting people like Charles Dickens, we're getting the orphan figure in literature, and we have one in, in this story as well. And we also have women who are not allowed to publish under their own names. And I'm going to start right there because there are lots of angry women characters in these novels. And we've got two today, maybe three altogether, all right? So you might be curious why her name is Carver Bell, and then you may not be. But women were not allowed to publish under their own names. They had to have a pseudonym, all right? 
they all, her, she and her sisters all used the last surname, Bell, after Charlotte's husband laid in her life, okay? And his name was Bell Nichols, or a, a combined, combined name, Arthur Bell Nichols. And they all took them. So she was Kerr Bell for Charlotte, for the C, okay? And then Anne, she had, she had uh, two siblings who survived, but one who didn't. She had... Th four sisters, three sisters. There were four sisters all together, and the the oldest one died young. And this is a time of TB, and other diseases. And they, in fact, all will die young. She's Cara Bell. Then there's Ellis Bell and and uh, and Be and her her sister all take different names and I'll show you those in just a moment. Okay. They all wrote novels. You've probably heard of Wuthering Heights, and that's Emily's. Okay. Um, and her, their sister isn't quite as famous, and yet her novel, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, is very, very good also. So what we've got is three novelists respected today, respected in their own time, but only under masculine names. Because why? It wasn't feminine to publish under your own name. It was just not feminine. And so uh, I'll leave you to decide what the real reason was, okay? They all died relatively young. Charlotte finally married Belle toward the end of her life and she was pregnant. Tragically, they both died. And that was the end of that wonderful, brilliant uh, Bronte line, but fortunately they left us their works and we have continued them. Now I want you to notice here when she says, to you I'm neither man nor woman, I come before you as an author only. That's what she wanted. I think all artists do. It is the sole standard by which you have a right to judge me, the sole ground on which I accept your judgment, because she knew they were criticizing her for publishing. So that's the world that we're living in. And here's the bit I was trying to get to, the other siblings and their names. And also Helen Burns' character is probably modeled after the sister that died the first, Maria or Mariah, in the 19th century at Lowood School, which is probably modeled on Cohen Bridge School, which the girls attended. There's a reason why I'm bringing that up, because I'm going to show you in a moment that the novel moves through place names toward the major theme. They had a brother, also Branwell, and this is very famous painting that he did of them, and he got so tired of, uh, of looking at himself in the painting, and he felt so guilty because he was a bit of a dandy, I'll put it that way, that he felt that he didn't deserve to be in the painting with his sisters, all right? Now, this is my picture. I was telling some jealous friends, I've actually been lucky enough to go to this spot. Charlotte Bronte and her family were, lived in Haworth in Yorkshire. You take a train from London and you head north and you go to the great to the uh, the lakes district lake district on the left and you go to Haworth and the Yorkshire's on the right and then you head over the Great Wall and you go over there into Scotland and you spend some time over there and you have this wonderful trip and they treat you beautifully and they preserve these uh, cottages, these churches, etc., the way they looked. This is the family home. Her father was a parson. Okay. Her mother, unfortunately, died young. And so daddy raised them pretty much with a nurse. Um, it is still there. You can take tours through there. And there you are. The famous moors that we see in Charlotte Bronte and Emily and Anne, all three of them write about the moors. It is their setting. This is my picture. And I talk about it being broody and warm and rolling. Lots of flowers, flowers and pots and baskets everywhere all through Haworth. Very cool. Um, you don't stay in a hotel. I don't think there's a hotel in the town. You stay in bed and breakfast and they treat you like royalty. And they're very, very sweet. And boy, do they love dogs. And I love dogs too. One of the things I've admired so much about the refugees that are trying to escape this week that we all know about is they've got their dogs and their cats in their arms and no matter how they get them out of there. Well, the British take their dogs everywhere with them as well and you will see them. And so, so much so that the sign in the door of a shop will say, dogs welcome well-behaved humans also. Dogs are always welcome. Now, sudden shift. 
that's a bit of a background over who wrote this. I'm going to start moving gently into the place names that are going to move toward the mad woman in the attic. The main spot is, is and I, my cursor, there it is, is Thornfield Hall. We have five place names. Jane is introduced at age eight. She's a very angry child with cause because she's been brutalized by her family her whole life, her aunt and uncle's kids. She is an orphan. Charles Dickens uses the orphan figure as well. So you have an orphan figure who has no rights. You have a female figure who has no rights. And they eventually kick her out of where she's staying. And Gates had the great snap behind her and she ends up at Lowood, which is that school I told you about that is modeled after Cohen Bridge. And there everybody gets sick and dies. That's how I remember the name Lowood because it's damp there. But she meets, meets two women. My, my contention is the woman stays sane and managed to make it in her life if she's got support. If she has trouble, if she's isolated, if she's abandoned, because women in this time had no rights at all. Even in a divorce, they could lose their kids. Women didn't get the vote in this country until the 19th Amendment in 1920. And we looked it up in Britain. It was like seven or not nine days after that, years after that. So we're talking about women who are escaping places constantly and trying to move up. She leaves Gateshead, goes to Lowood. Who's helping her? The women. Her name is Miss Temple. Her name fits. She's a lovely, wonderful person. The other one's name is Helen Burns. She burns with an ecstasy for Christ. She's a wonderful, wonderful person who's also dying. Lots of people dying in the Victorian novels. But... In the years that Jane is there, they are guiding her. She's blessed with sisters, so to speak, who guide her every step of the way. When Miss Temple leaves and Helen dies and Jane is, I'm sorry, I'm talking fast. I got a lot to do real fast. And Jane leaves. She is now employed, 18 years old. What can a middle class girl do who cannot go to college, not allowed to go to college, who has no civil rights, no vote, no nothing, and she's not going to be allowed to work in shops, she's going to be a teacher, preferably a governess so that she can work in one home. Charlotte Bronte and all the girls actually were teachers. Charlotte hated it. She hated it teaching and she hated the little boogers in the classroom too she would tell you all right so jane is not real happy about the job either except that this man's daughter we think is a lovely child and she's easy to work with so she goes to this place you see it thornfield it is a manse a mansion She's going into a rich man's house. The first time she runs into him, she scares his horse and he falls off. And that's how Jane Eyre introduces herself to Edward Rochester. He's actually pretty taken with her, amazed that her his dog pilot likes her so much that his horse threw him. That's how they meet. It's very interesting. She moves in here. I'm going to move away from here for in just a second. And the, this story is ostensibly about Jane Eyre's journey. There will be another trip where she will have to leave because He's trying to get her to marry him. And then there will be another trip and she will go to to uh, the country, Moore's End. And then she will end up finally at the fifth place, Ferndean. Every single one of the five steps is a journey motif. And in the interest of time, what I have to leave that with is there's a female guide at every one who is helping this orphan figure find herself. Okay. But you say, why is that house burning? Yes, it's Thornfield. OK, let me quickly tell you that you need to see movie adaptations, but I put these in here. Um, there are many, many, and they're wonderful. It films beautifully, and I'm not telling you the whole story. But she, notice, is regarded as plain Jane. She's small, not even barely five feet tall. Um, 
this is um, uh, Michael Fassbender. Some of you know him. He's very cool, very gorgeous, and he plays Rochester in this particular film. The the version all the way back to the early 40s is the one my sainted mother loved uh, because it was Orson Welles playing Rochester, Eric. And when he calls Jane, Jane, my mother said we just we just lost it. It's hard to believe, but he was a rock star, and he was worth. Uh, Fassbender would probably appeal to to most of us more, but if you know. Notice Rochester is also with this beauty, and she is beautiful. The figure who is the protagonist in Jane Eyre, who wins the day, is small, supposedly plain. She's deliberately named Jane, doesn't have a whole lot of background supporting her, has had to fight for every scrap her entire life, and has had to avoid being locked up herself her entire life life. There have been male figures who've done this to her, but female as well. But notice, she gets to be the Puritan look here. Look who the mad woman is. Everybody got it immediately. I'm so happy. Why is that? Right? She's gorgeous. She looks a little crazy, doesn't she? That's his wife. That is his wife. When, when Our Lady moves into here, this place to take care of Adele, to teach Adele. She doesn't, doesn't know that she's going to fall in love with Rochester. We all know that it's predictable, right? The, the so-called plain Jane is really actually quite beautiful and gorgeous and sexy in her own right. We redefine that, correct? And she's going to capture us. She's going to make us fall in love with her. And he does fall in love with her. And there are people here who help her along the way, too, because he's dangerous for her. His love for her, he does love her. His love for her is dangerous. Why? Because he's married. How do we know that she's married? At night, because she's our protagonist, she's our first person narrator, she tells us that she hears laughter. It's maniacal mania, maniacal laughter and somebody talking to herself. So she asks people, everybody in the house, where's the guy? I hear that in the middle of the night and they, and they lie to her. They say, oh, well, that's Grace Poole. She's one of the servants. Well, there's a Grace Poole, all right, but that's not who's doing the laughing. It's this woman. Her name is Bertha Mason. She looks crazy, doesn't she? But she's also beautiful, isn't she? She looks a bit obsessed. And of course, the makeup around the eyes, et cetera. The relationship is very passionate between, in, the, in, that, in that picture, it's very close, where it seems almost puritanical in the one with Jane, because Jane's the good girl, right? Bertha Mason is mm, not. What happens in this story, I'm right, right, fast as I can, she is a rich person that the family does not particularly like, and they don't want her around, and they suspect that she's mentally ill. What do you do if you're rich with a mentally ill daughter? In the Middle Ages, you send her off to be a nun. In this period, you marry her off to a rich man, an autocrat. And that's what they do. Do they tell him? No. Is it his fault that he's married to a crazy lady? No. Do we let him out for that? No. Because what he does is lock her in an attic. This is a woman who has rights, we think, but she does not remember how I started this. She has nothing protecting her, even in a marriage. She has nothing protecting her. Now, on the other hand, you could argue at least he didn't send her to the asylums because that would have been worse. I come back with, well, then why didn't you give her a suite of rooms anyway and, you know, and, let, her, and let her feel like a human being? Why is she in the attic? The Mad Woman in the Attic is the title of a very important scholarly work by Gilbert and Gubar back in, the, back in the 1970s. And they're the ones, I'm giving them full credit, they're the ones who said, wait a minute. This woman that everybody else ignores in the novel is what the novel is really about. And when you see that, and then you look at Jane again, Jane's been very lucky, hasn't she? She's an orphan figure and it's hard on her, but every step of the way, remember, people are helping her. Nobody ever helped Bertha Mason, ever. So remember that fire? 
This is this is Bertha. I'm going to take you back to the fire. I'm going fast, so I'm Do you see everything right here? Grace Poole is actually a drunken servant who doesn't take care of her, and she forgets to lock the door, and she gets out. And she goes out, and she starts listening and paying attention. She's not stupid. There's an article that says, how, ma how crazy is she, really? I ask that question, too. Is she crazy? You re go through all of these. She realizes that they have fallen in love, that he has asked her to marry him. Well, what's that called? It's called adultery. He is inviting her to be an adulterer. Charlotte Bronte's father is a preacher. She's not going to let her heroine commit adultery. So how are we going to save her? She's at the, at the door. She's at the altar. She's about ready to do this. And interestingly enough, it is Bertha Mason's brother who warns her. There are good men at all of these stations, and I think Rochester is, very quickly. She's about to be sold out, and it's Rochester's fault. The brother warns her. She runs away, as a good girl should. She goes to another preacher and another town, and that's a whole other story. But she is saved. In the process, the symbols are these. Bertha Mason gets out, finds the veil that she's preparing to wear for her wedding, rips it in half. And the imagery, of course, is very clear, ripping them apart. That when he asks her to marry him and she says, yes, they're standing under a thorn tree, the lightning, storm imagery, it's all through Frankenstein also, storm imagery, and it breaks the tree, of schism again. Finally, she tries to burn him up in bed. <laughs> the, the, the mad woman in the attic, the one who's not getting in the help, remember I said there's a lot of rage, is very, very angry and with cause. So since the veil didn't work, since the split tree, she didn't cause that, but she hoped it would, she creeps downstairs and sets the bed on fire with him in it. He's okay because Jane smells the smoke and the fire and saves him. Jane started off as an orphan figure filled with rage. At each step along this journey, this the French call it rite de passage, a passage rite, she is learning how to be strong and how to protect herself. And that will free you up to protect others as well. She saves him, and but then he tries to hurt her by, keep, by keeping her, he will hurt her, and he knows that. And so she runs away. I'm almost there. She runs away. The place where she's gone is actually worse. But in the meantime, things happen. I've got to skip through that. She hears his voice. Remember Orson Welles, Jane, Jane. Okay. He calls her. In Streetcar Named Desire, okay, he's, he's screaming, right, Eric? And, and that voice, that male voice, and that's when the woman knows she's won, okay? She's up here, Stella. She's up here. He's calling for her. She has won. In this one, Jane realizes that even though he had lied to her, the part of her that loves him and is ministering to him recognizes the pain in his voice. This is not the same Rochester. So her is back, okay, stagecoach, so not so hurrying. She arrives, and this is what she finds. The, the bed, uh, the, the whole house, everything has burned to the ground. And where she is, and I'm going here, where she is now is Ferndine. She finds him. This is how Rochester is redeemed and how Jane Eyre escapes being the mad woman in the attic. But I credit the mad woman in the attic for what they get. She finds him blind and disabled because he tried to save his wife's life. And that's probably what saves Rochester. We always knew there was something good about him, too. Because he tried to save his wife, she actually throws herself into the flames. What else can the mad woman do? Nobody has ever protected her. I told Sampado, a student of mine wrote in her journal one time, if you don't have the unconditional love of your own family, you don't stand a chance. You've got no chance at all. All right? That's how the mad woman in the attic feels, and she's done. She's out. She hurls herself in. He gets saved. 
if you will, because he tries to save her. So it closes. I'm not going to go into all the details, but it says here, reader, I married him. She made that decision. She can now because Bertha is gone, but it's on her terms. She decided to come back. He can't function by himself now. It's better than being the mad woman in the attic, and it's better than being the unloved wife. And she takes care of him. Yes, there is a child which represents the future, etc. One more point I wanted to make. There are two women who are very, very important in this time period. Mary Wollstonecraft okay, who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, who's been telling women all through the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries, you, ne you need more. And she believed in physical education as well as, well as education, okay? And then later, later on, other writers as well, and names are gone because I'm trying to go so fast, keep persuading women that they need to challenge. We finally got the vote. Things are happening all over again. I'm not going to go political on you, but we still haven't won this battle yet. And where Sampada is going is how do we treat the mad woman in the attic? Because she didn't get any at all, right? And she ended up dead. And it took the other woman, her everything she had, to survive. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Sampada and let her show you what happens to figures when they get zero help or they get the wrong help. Mm -hmm. You have the journey motif. The journey motif. Thank you. I was trying to get out of here. Okay. Well, I don't. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to. I already did. Okay. So what I say here is what happens. Thank you. Okay. And these are all various women who played. See, I see Bertha that way too. And Jane's always see, and it bothers me because she's always supposed to be prim and 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 she can't be beautiful. She can't be sexy, right? And these are all sultry, aren't they? Okay, and the journey motif that Sampat is talking about here is the one that I just took you on, where she ends up moving toward her freedom, that is Jane, through grace and love of people in her life. I was trying to kind of combine them, okay? These are all the, and I found these on Google, all right? There's my source, but there's so many of them. And this is what I just talked to you about. She starts here. And she moves up through these places. She is destined for Thornfield. It's always going to be there. That's where the test is for her. That is also the land of the of Bertha Mason. And others, both women figures end up in Thornfield. Only one can come out of that. And it's the one who has both of them come out of it in a way because one escapes by by throwing herself into the flames. But the other one sort of, quote unquote, wins the day by pulling out of that, coming back, putting his health and his need ahead of her own, making her the, re, the, the redemptor in a way, the making her the grace. I'm done. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time on a Friday afternoon to come see us. And everybody who has logged in online, thank you also for joining us. Okay. Everything good. All right, I am going to move you from Charlotte Bronte to Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This is the story of two Charlottes. And Charlotte Perkins Gilman was an American woman. She was a writer, a lecturer, an economist, and a theorist born in Hartford, Connecticut. Gilman's father abandoned their family when Gilman was very young, so she grew up in relative poverty. Her mother had to actually move from relative to relative to make ends meet, so she, she didn't grow up in a privileged background. When she grew up, she went to design school and she was an artist, and at one point of time, I find this so interesting, that she worked as a greeting card designer, and she designed greeting cards. That's how she supported herself. At one point of time during this time, she met fellow artist Charles Stetson, who was her first husband, and got married uh, to him. With him, she had her only child, Catherine Beecher Stetson. And after, shortly after she had her, her daughter, she got depressed, which was probably at that point of time undiagnosed postpartum depression. Nobody knew what postpartum depression was back then. so. It just went undiagnosed and she decided, her husband and she decided that she should go under the care of a doctor called Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell. 
he was famous for a therapy called in quotes the rest cure and the rest cure basically meant that you should rest <laughs> it's not very complex just rest don't do anything eat relax eat some more sleep rest <laughs> wouldn't we all like to do that but unfortunately it wasn't as much fun as it sounds especially for somebody as artistic as gilman while she was getting the cure she got pampered a lot she ate she rested she got massages she temporarily felt better but then she came back home and she realized it's not working anymore i am depressed i am pretty miserable and all i want to do is to pick up my pen or my brush and go back to my art and so that's what she did she took her diagnosis in her own hands. She took her cure in her own hands and decided that she wants to do whatever pleases her, whatever makes her happy. And realized that Dr. Mitchell's therapy was not for her. And that is what inspired the yellow wallpaper, which is what I will be talking about today. Now this Charlotte Perkins Gilman, if she was given the choice to state whether she was a scholar would would fairly say no i am not a scholar do not call me that but she was she wrote a lot she wrote extensively throughout her whole life and she wrote on various topics so remember in the first slide i talked about how she was an economist uh, a theorist um, a, a writer so i am going to go backwards because i want to talk about something that she wrote that has been in the news since i would say even the, as far as the 80s uh, a work that was rediscovered of hers, which is called A Suggestion on the Negro Problem. This is a work that she published in 1908 in the American Journal of Sociology. And in it, she clearly states that she believes that white people are the superior race. Plain and simple, she says, black people are trying to speed up their racial evolution, in quotes, and are not succeeding. She, the suggestion that she has on the Negro problem is that, I quote, Negroes below a certain grade of citizenship should enroll in a semi-military organization in order to perform dignified labor, which would help them develop work habits and self-discipline and become more productive members of society. Yeah. She also admits on the other hand that she thinks that not everybody is a problem. And there are some quote unquote progressive Negroes, but her views on race and ethnicities just got worse as she got older. And as she got older, she got even more racist, even more xenophobic to go so far as to consider eugenics, which is, if you don't know what eugenics is, just look it up um, as what is eugenics. Is that what it is? Eugenics is when white people marry white people and smart people marry smart people. And there's no mix intermingling of, of anybody so that the, there's purity at, at all times, right? So that's what she believes. So she was that, that much of a racist. And I point that out because on the one hand, while she was a racist, she was also a feminist. And fem being a feminist is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. She wanted equality of the genders. And you can be both. You can be, on the one hand, somebody who fights for all genders and, and, and makes sure that brings about thoughts and ideas that mean for the equality of genders. But you can also be, on the other hand, a racist. And she was, unfortunately. Um, in her other work, which is also famous, called Women in Economics, it's basically a manifesto that talks about how the role of women should not be limited to being mothers and sisters and grandmothers and, and daughters and wives. Women can be more. And she goes so far as to say that even in 1898, she, she believes that women should have jobs and women should have economic independence if they want to succeed in life and if they want to have a better place in society, they should just go for economic independence and not depend on someone else to provide them financially. And so those are the two sides of Gilman and I just want to put them forward and you can decide how you feel about her. But we will focus specifically on a short story called The Yellow Wallpaper, which is easily available online because it is so old. It was published in 1892. And like I said before, this story is based on her own experiences. Gilman went through postpartum depression. It went undiagnosed. It went unnamed because such a thing did not was not 
d uh, discovered or named by therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists. The unique thing about this story is that it is told from the perspective of the person who is going crazy, which is interesting. You see stories about crazy people, right? You don't hear the story from their perspective, even more so in the present tense, which is how the story is written. It is written in the present tense. So we see her going crazy in real time. The unfortunate thing about her is that she is pampered. Her husband loves her, takes care of her, but you can decide whether he does. Um, but he does not listen to her. She has no voice. She has no agency. She does not get listened to because she's just a woman. What does she know, right? And the other part that is different from her real life is that her mother, her mother, her husband is also her doctor. In real life, Gilman's husband was an artist. Her doctor was a therapist who believed in extreme measures. There were two men. In this case, they both are the same, which makes her oppression even worse. So let's talk about the story if you haven't read it. The yellow wallpaper begins with the narrator telling us that she has moved to this mansion, which could almost be haunted if she so thought or if, if she let her imagination go crazy. And they've moved to this beautiful palatial place because her original home, her, her real home is being renovated. So they found this rental place. They've moved over there with her. She tells us after many, many pages that they've moved there with their with her newborn baby. She has her sister-in-law and there's also a nanny for the baby. So John is her, is her husband slash doctor and the narrator does not have a name. And that is important because I think Gilman is trying to tell you that this could be anybody. This could be you, this could be me, this could be somebody who lives next door to you. She doesn't have a name. She's, not, she's so less important that she doesn't even deserve a name. And so she tells us that we came here to this mansion um, and she says it's colonial, a hereditary estate, I would say a haunted house if I let my imagination go crazy. And so it's beautiful and they move in over there and her husband follows the orders of what Dr. Weir Mitchell has made famous at this point of time in, in, in when the story is happening, that just rest. You are not feeling so good. She comes into the house not feeling so great. And you can sort of surmise that since she's had a baby, she's probably going through postpartum depression. So she, according to him, is going through, and I quote, um, a temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency. Because what are women if not hysterical? Right? We all are. Um, so he thinks it's, you get over it. Give it a few days, right? Um, and, and so whatever she says about how she feels is not important. He thinks it's a slight thing. It's a temporary thing. And he says, let's just rest. Don't do anything. Don't pick up a pen. Don't write. And so she's writing this to us in hiding. She sneaks up. She, she, she makes sure that when she's in her room, nobody's watching, nobody's there uh, outside listening, and she writes. So we get to know her story because she's sneaking around her husband. And she, at one point of time in the story, her husband threatens her, if you don't listen to me, if you don't follow my orders, I will take you to Dr. Mitchell and I will drop you off over there and you will have to go through this 100%. There's no other choice. So this room that she has been Set, set up in is a room that she doesn't want to be in. She says that I wanted the room downstairs that opened on the piazza and had roses all over the and, uh, uh, roses all over the windows and old fashioned chins hangings, but John doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want her to have the room uh, on the ground floor. He wants her to have the room upstairs. Uh, and so they took the nursery at the top of the house and she says it was a big airy room. There were windows all over. It was a nursery first and then a playroom or and a gymnasium, I should judge, for the windows are barred and there are rings and things on the walls. So what is this room that he is keeping her in? He th he, she thinks that it is a nursery, but she also says that the bed is uh, nailed to the floor and the windows are barred. So is it really a place that was a nursery before or is it something else? On the other hand, can we question whether this narrator knows what's going on really around her? Is she really a wife or is she an insane woman who is in the hospital? But that's taking it too far too soon. But the worst part about this room 
is that it has this yellow wallpaper that she absolutely hates. And I got all of this wonderful art that students probably have done for their classes. So I'm, I'm imagining that this is the unnamed narrator sitting in her room, sneakily writing with that, with that awful wallpaper in the back. She says that the wallpaper was stripped off and had gray patches all around the bed of my head. She says, and she describes the wallpaper as such. She says, it is dull enough to confuse the eye in following, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study. And when you follow the lame uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide, plunge off at outrageous angles, destroy themselves in unheard of contradictions. So. And at one, another point of time, she says, there is a recurrent spot where the pattern lolls like a broken neck and two bulbous eyes stare at you upside down. This is a woman with an imagination. This is a woman who is an artist. So when she sees a pattern, she starts to see things. That's what happens with artistic people, right? And also remember, for us, being closed up in a room after the pandemic doesn't feel that terrible. But at one point of time, if you were forced to be in a room that you don't want to be in without your cell phones or your Netflixes, even sane people would go crazy, right? Even normal people would go crazy. Imagine somebody who already is suffering from postpartum depression. How much more terrible would that situation be? And so the longer she stays in this room, the worse it gets. They're supposed to be there for three months and he puts her up in this room. And the longer she stays, the worse it starts to affect her. So in the beginning, she only sees things that she's she sees things visually that are hallucinations, but then it changes. It gets more pronounced to being auditory hallucinations, hearing things. It changes to being olfactory hallucinations where she smells things. At one point of time, she says that I could smell the wallpaper. It had a yellow sulfur smell. No, none of us wants to be in this room. So the, the novel was written in 1892, right? And I wanted to sort of draw a parallel between how bad things get. And I remember it's about mad women and feminists. And here we have a woman who is going mad and she tells us how her condition gets worse over time and how she keeps fighting with her husband, who is also her doctor. At the beginning of the story, she says, John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in a marriage. This is how she thinks a marriage should be. She's accepted it. She's fine with it. He just thinks that I am quote unquote funny for having all these ideas. She also goes so far as to say John is a physician, physician and perhaps, perhaps that is the reason I don't get well because he doesn't believe me. If he was just my husband, maybe he and I could convince the doctor that I am not getting better. But he's my physician and he won't listen to me. If a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? Here she is trying to convince her doctor, her husband, that I am not well. Please believe me. At one point of time when she's trying to talk to John and convince him that she's not getting better, in fact, that she's getting worse, she starts to cry because she just, like I said, she doesn't have a voice. She doesn't have an agency. She doesn't, she can't even finish her argument with him. He says, bless her little heart. She shall be as sick as she pleases. Patronizing, right? You can be sick if you want. Sure. Pat on your head. She never, he never refers to her by her name. She's unnamed. Instead, she calls, she, he calls her little goose, blessed little, uh, yeah, a little goose, she calls her blessed little heart, my little child, my little darling, treating her in an infantile way. She's not even, this is the mother of his child. But for him, she's not smart enough to be a grown up. She's just a little child. And so this in 1892 is a woman's struggle to convince her husband slash doctor that she's not feeling well. This here is the collected schizophrenia, uh, a collection of essays by a writer called Esme Waijun Wang, and it was published in 2019. Look at the difference in time, but look at the struggles of this woman in her real life. She says, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2001, but heard my first auditory hallucination, vo a voice in 2005. 
I communicated this to Dr. C, my psychiatrist at the time, but she never uttered the words schizoaffective disorder, even when I reported that I was dodging invisible demons on campus, that I'd watched a fully formed locomotive roar toward me before vanishing. I began to call these experiences sensory distortions, a phrase that Dr. C readily adopted in my presence instead of hallucinations, which was what they were. Here is a doctor in sometime in the 2000s telling her patient, it's not hallucinations, just sensory distortions. Blessed little child, it's just distortions, right? She says, some people dislike diagnosis, disagreeably calling them boxes and labels. But I find a diagnosis is comforting because it provides a framework. Yes, it does. You want the doctor to accept one, you're sick, two, tell you what is wrong with you, and three, give you the right treatment, right? And for those of you who know a little bit about medicine or have all, all the women who've ever gone to a doctor, you don't get believed the first time you tell anybody anything to a physician, right? Women are always told, you feel better, you're overreacting. You're not in pain, you feel fine. Can you stop being so dramatic about everything? Which is the same thing over here. And later she says, it was I was officially diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, eight years after experiencing my first hallucination. It took her eight years to be diagnosed. Fortunately, she was diagnosed, but it took her eight years. And this is in the 21st century. Imagine how the narrator was feeling in 1892. So coming back to the story, we see that her madness is getting worse. She says, at night in any kind of light, in twilight, candlelight, lamplight, and worst of all by moonlight, the design becomes bars. The wallpaper design, the outside pattern and the woman behind it as plain as can be. So as she is getting crazier, it's not just the weird design, it's also things that are moving behind the design. There's a woman behind the bars in the wallpaper and there are bars that are caging her. So on one hand, you can say that, you know, if you if you're the kind of psychiatry nerd that you become after watching a lot of television, you can probably think that she is splitting herself. She's seeing her own personality, which is caged in the room in this personality behind the bar, right? She's seeing that uh, there's a woman who's caged, who cannot escape, and I need to save her. She says, I really have discovered something at last through watching so much at night as it changes. So I have finally found out the front pattern does move and no wonder the woman behind shakes it. And she shakes it because she's trying to get out. She's trying to escape, just like this narrator is trying to escape from this oppressive, suppressive marriage that she is in. And the situation where she is in, where she doesn't want to be told to be in a room. She wants to get out. She wants to meet family. She wants to write. She wants to be creative. And so the story comes to an end where you know there is no hope. You know that she is not going to get better. She is getting worse over the course of the three months that she's been there and her husband has no idea. He's been going to town. He's been treating other patients who are quote unquote more important cases because he thinks she's fine. Although she has told him in so many words, she is not. So towards the end of the story, she, she realizes that their time at this rented mansion is coming to an end that she needs to somehow get the woman out of the wallpaper so she can escape before the narrator moves out. So as she realizes that we will leave in a day or two, she starts to tear down the design. She first tries to scratch away the bars, but she obviously can't do that. So she just starts to tear the wallpaper down and let the woman loose or so she thinks. And as she's doing that, she locks herself up in the room. She throws the keys out. And when John comes knocking on the door and afraid of what is going on, she says, oh, just go get the keys from downstairs. So he, he goes downstairs, fetches the keys, comes up, opens the door and sees that things have gone crazy. And she has, she has torn down all of the wallpaper you can imagine how she looks, you know, all bedraggled and crazy and losing her mind, literally. And he says, what's the matter? He cried, for God's sake, what are you doing? I kept on creeping. And at this point of time, she started creeping on all fours like an animal because she's losing her sense of being a human, literally, right? And also that childlike imagery. Remember, he treats her like a child. So she's literally going to go on all fours and behave like a child. I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. 
I've got out at last, I said, in spite of you and Jane. I've pulled off the paper so you can't put me back. So that split personality happens, right? She thinks that she's the woman in the wallpaper and she cannot be put back in that cage. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did and right across my path by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. So she's just going crazy around the room, creeping around and round and round in circles. And because it is written in real time, it, you know, I had to cre keep creeping over him. It seems as if she's still doing that, right? <laughs> to this day, she's continuing to do that. So that's how the story ends. This is the last line. And that that is what she leaves us with. We have no future for her, no future for John. We don't have any idea what happens to the baby. So why did he faint? You know, we know that he is a doctor. Has he ever seen something like this before? She tells us at the beginning that he is somebody who is extremely practical, believes in things only that he can see. And so what is madness with something that you cannot see really, right? But when he sees a physical manifestation of quote unquote madness, he faints. Good job, doctor. <laughs> and that's how the story ends. But let's wrap this up so that you can go home. We started with Bertha Mason. That was our woman in the attic. She was locked up. She was a wife. She was supposed to be, she was supposed to live a good life. She was supposed to be married to a rich man and be his wife and take care of, but somehow she turned out to be crazy and she was locked up in the attic. What if Bertha Mason was the woman in the yellow wallpaper? And the Jane that she's referring to in that last sentence is Jane Eyre. <laughs> Who is Jane, right? Gilman doesn't tell us who Jane is. The name of the narrator is never told. There is a sister-in-law, but she's Jenny. So we never find out who Jane is. And my hope is that somehow these two works that are about 40 years apart, 50 years apart, are somehow connected. And Gilman, who told us that she was not a scholar, had most likely read Jane Eyre. And what if the character of Bertha Mason stayed with her? And she loved her, and she thought, why don't we say something about what Bertha's story was? And that's our presentation. We have time for questions. So, and just uh, Safada so and uh, Joan, just make sure to repeat the question for the online audience. Sure. You may see questions in the chat box from the online audience. Does anybody have a question? I just have one question. Yes, ma'am. I always thought that Jane was a governess because I thought there were parts of the story where Jane was pretty much the full time mother of the baby. That's Mary. Oh, the governess is Mary. Mary. Okay. Jenny, that's okay. Uh, Jenny is the name of the sister-in-law, and that's what most of my students think too, that Jenny and Jane are the same person, which could possibly be it. Mm -hmm. She could just be misspeaking, but she is referred to as Jenny multiple times, and there's only one Jane. I like your idea. Though. I like it too. Thank you. <laughs> so, when was Yellow Wallpaper published? 1892. So by that point, Ibsen's Dollhouse has been published and premiered in the U.S. Nice. Because I hear a lot of strong parallels in the whole to, my to the Doll's House. Mm -hmm. And that entire mm -hmm. concept. So the, for those of you who are online, we just, uh, Professor Skiles told us how the dollhouse was performed in the U.S. by 18, 1883, 1883 in Kentucky, the kind of place that would watch a dollhouse. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, it's the, he sees parallels between the uh, doll's house and um, the yellow wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Joan, while you were speaking, uh, I remembered something from many years ago, because it, it was a long time ago that I read Jane Eyre, that there's a prequel that was written by Gene, I looked it up, by Gene Bryce in the 60s called mm -hmm. Life's Hard SOC. Mm -hmm. That's the life of Bertha. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Can you, can you speak to that? And, um, no. No, because I, we haven't read it. Okay. But there is White Sargasso C by Jean Reese. Jean, Jean Reese? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. And you mentioned that Bertha's from Wealth, 
and apparently she came from Jamaica, which mm -hmm. would imply is in the case of many of us. I'm, I'm sorry, I have I read it so long ago, like when I was a kid. And for the audience, he and I do this to each other. It's been like almost 40 years. <laughs> I really can't remember it. And so you know what I'm gonna do when I go home. And yeah, then I'll I, and then I'll email you. And, it's a good question. No, it really is. It me, though, if, if, if her background is in Jamaica, and in part yes. the family's wealth is based on slavery, mm. yeah. and that would fit in very well. Okay, now I'm going to go home and read it. Yeah. It's been on my to-read to yeah. list for a long time, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah, we will now, Stevie. Thank you. <laughs> the professor has spoken. <laughs> no, it's good. We don't have any questions on WebEx. We answered all their questions. Yeah. Thank, you for coming, man. Thank you so much. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.